Well, thank you for having me. I let me start with two uh, independent apologies. One is uh, to all of you for, and particularly to Libby for not delivering the slides till yesterday at some point. Uh, when Ben asked me to present, I my presumption was uh, since it was about uh, you know a few weeks ago, I thought this was some uh, kind of pickup pickup uh, conference. In fact, <laughs> turns out that it's n not quite a pickup conference. It is all the kinds of distinguished people. Uh, uh, I, I had not quite adjusted for it. I apologize for that as well. Uh, so, and then I realized that there are all kinds of distinguished people from all over the uh, country have co come here. So, I, uh, and uh, I would have probably then not agreed to present, both because this is a just-in-time production and uh, the results are evolving as they go, uh, and also, also, also because uh, that meant that uh, Zoe had to interrupt her. Zoe is one of our, our co-authors. Interrupt her um, homework for different uh, Harvard classes to uh, to do the uh, to do pr produce new versions of the slide. So bo for both of those reasons, I think I would have stayed off from trying to present. The second apology is that this, uh, for unusually for me, has no, almost nothing to do with development economics. You could there is a location. Uh, one of our data data sets come from Malaysia, but once I uh, had said that, you wouldn't know whether if this was Ma Malaysia or you know some other place. Um, I know Marine County. I don't think would change very much in my presentation. So it will be other than the fact that. You know, there's a new new market and an older market. I don't think there's anything development about this presentation. That so let me let me launch in. So it's joint work with uh, Rima and Zoe, and both of them are m infinitely more on top of the uh, the you know the the, the all, everything, but including the structure of the data. So I might actually sometimes r ask them questions if you ask me a hard one about. Okay, so what what's, what is this about? This is about, uh, I think, ride-sharing markets, but I think has implications for many similar markets. And I think one fun. So this is there's a lo long and I think distinguished tradition of research on uh, how markets uh, go to equilibrium, if you like. You know what what happens. Uh, how do markets clear? There's a you know there is I think. Starting with Vernon Smith, there is a very large literature on on this idea that you know if we if supply and demand are uh, you you have a bunch of people who are, for example, carrying out a double auction or some version of a double auction, you you converge quite fast to the market clearing price, and this 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 is what uh, Vernon Smith. Uh, uh, I think originally short, and uh, John List is famous for having uh, moved that to settings where uh, there is less of a formal double auction. So uh, very, very much the question. Now, all of that works very well in settings where there is um, sup supply and demand are at some level known to the players, and th th that's a. Uh, there are different ways of doing that. One is uh, you have essentially all the suppliers and all the demanders constantly bidding uh, in the same place, and then you can learn about. It. So you can, it don't, doesn't have to be formally that there's a supply curve that's known. You can know it by uh, observing the uh, you know the buying or selling decisions uh, of of other people. But that that to me that. Uh, to us, this 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 is a very key key assumption, and it changes, and this is what changes when you go from uh, you know ride taxis to ride sharing, from hotels to uh, hotels to uh, house sharing markets. Because what happens in each of these cases is that the entry is driven by uh, people like you and me who just decide to take it on. And therefore, unlike in the taxi market where there is a fixed supply of medallions with a price, in fact, uh, which you uh, 
so it gives you a pretty good idea what the demand pr projections are, pretty good idea what the supply supply uh, uh, situation is. Uh, likewise, hotels are, you know, you can look it up. For any city, you can look up the vacancy rates of hotels. If you want to build a hotel in uh, Wichita, Kansas, you can just look it up. So that, that particular fact cannot be, it's simply not feasible within the range of uh, house sharing market because as you'll see in a minute, both because they are sort of individuals, but also because they're volatile, because people, it depends very much on people's beliefs about all these other things. If you, you, you know, you would enter a market if you believe that the, the demand situation is, you know, uh, particularly favorable, and if, if it's not, you would want to enter the market, and so it depends on what I think uh, someone else thinks about the market. So all kinds of quantity information uh, are, are taken in these markets by, um, sorry, all kinds of quantity information influence decisions taken in these markets by the players. These quantity, this quantity information is not known, especially on the supply side. Maybe the demand side is relatively stable, but even that's not actually true. The demand side has been evolving. Uh, one of the sort of sad facts about the ride sharing industries that the numbers suggest that the they have added rather than subtracted from traffic that's a, a, a it's not my talk it's some some other fa uh, but it's because the demand people have ch actually decided that they r would behave differently because ride sharing is available and so so on and you know, for all of those reasons i think that this is a very a very different ball, ball game from trying to learn uh, you know, where there is a fixed supply to fixed demand. So think of this as being the critical uh, starting point of this is that, uh, now why does that make a difference? Why do, why do we care? Um, I said most of these things, um, but one of the things I didn't say is that there is actually an old literature showing that once there is a, a, a lot of key information becomes um, is sort of unobserved, you get uh, the markets don't work as well. So even in, in, in double auctions, if, if, the, there is, uh, uh, there is, if people don't know the common, common shock to the market, then you get adverse selection. And there is uh, experimental evidence of that. So there's a long tradition of people showing that markets don't work nearly as well as soon as you start introducing some kind of a, a aggregate aggregate uncertainty and since I, I was arguing in a minute ago that there is lots of aggregate uncertainty in these markets. So that's, that's uh, now that's, so uh, you know, and in particular in these markets of course what the variable you want to know just to put a word, uh, use, a, use a word that I will uh, come back to is the match rate. So you know you want to know not, the price is more or less fixed, Uber does change its prices uh, from time to time, many of the ride-sharing companies don't change their prices at all, and uh, in those cases, where all that matters is really the the quantities, the match, m the match rate, uh, the expected match rates on both sides, and how do you know the match rate? Yeah. By the way, uh, since uh, as as uh, as Ben said. Uh, we didn't deliver our slides to Libby early enough. Uh, there's more time t for me to be interrupted. So if, if you look, if, if there is a point where you feel baffled by uh, what I'm saying. So what is, what is, what are the set of questions we're going to look at? Well, first, uh, you could imagine that uh, there is potential for inefficiency. Uh, there is two sources of potentially the market and not working uh, perfectly. One is just learning. People may not know what the situation is. They may not enter as a result. They, they or they might en enter, they may be too enthusiastically en enter and then discover that uh, they are actually doing badly and exit and you could imagine cobwebs and all kinds of things which happen when, when you don't know, when, when you don't know the, uh, don't know the, quantities. Uh, also, there is the possibility of, of multiple equilibria. This is, this is old literature in, 
in such theory showing basically that when when we are trying if supply generates uh, demand and demand generates supply, so you get positive feedback lo loops from supply to demand. Basically, if there are more people, then I'm, you know, if I'm going to en enter and it's going to be, you know, either I'm going to get a driver in three minutes or in 67 minutes, I'm unlikely to enter that market. If the market is thicker, for example, there's more people in it, then that's going to generate uh, a more stable supply and therefore I'll enter. There's a, actually an old tradition of people people showing that they, these markets tend to ha potentially have multiple equilibria. Yeah. Can you give us a sense of uh, whether it's important that there are maybe pretty low fixed costs in these markets? If I have a car, yes. I can drive. So, so, so uh, it's, 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 it's an excellent point. So I was implicitly saying that there is very low fixed cost. And the reason why there is volatility is precisely because of that. If there's a time to build, for example, then we would have a lot of hotels. The hotel market is well understood partly because there's time to build. So, you know, you will have uh, how many hotels are going to come, how many beds will come on a line we, in the next one year is predicted already. So, this is a market where you can't do that. So, that's key is that the fixed cost, there isn't really a lot of uh, time to build and uh, and uh, kind of a, a, a fixed large fixed investment involved which would then make the market much more predictable you kind of you can't uh, if it's, if the beds are going to come in line in you know 18 months we know from today what's going to happen in 18 months yeah could it, I, maybe this is where you're going but couldn't the apps provide a lot of that information and on match rate and, and uh, could also couldn't they to some extent, I mean, isn't part of what Uber does try to coordinate by subsidizing a lot of people to come in in a particular city to make the market think at the beginning? So that's exactly where I'm going with it. I'm going to explore how well those strategies work. That's, that's the whole point of this exercise is, uh, you know, for example, in the extreme uh, case, can I, have a one-term time subsidy or a short-term subsidy and change the equilibrium, either because it's learning, so people learn that the market is, uh, you know, better, more fun to do this, the, or worse, uh, can we change the equilibrium, or in, in extremists, can I move to, the, to a different equilibrium altogether? It's not crucial. It's not crucial. It just is another source. Uh, the point I'm making is that here we're going to focus mostly on quantity. The experiments will be designed around quantity information. And quantity information is in a in a in a fully price flexible market where you know the quantity doesn't matter at all. I don't need to tell you what quantity is. You just respond to the price. Here I'm going to have people responding to quantities and, and prices, as it will turn out. That, that was a clarified question. So if prices were fully flexible, nobody would need to worry about. Correct, but pr prices are not fully flexible. Partly, partly. I mean, that's that's a feature of this market. Whether they, I I will not have nothing interesting to say about whether the market could be redesigned to have flexible prices. I haven't actually thought enough of some flexibility you were Very not. little uh, relative to uh, the amount of fluctuation and that there is in demand and supply. There's some, if it hits some cutoff, then it goes up. But in the markets we're going to look at, actually even less. And if you think of in India, uh, Uber basically doesn't do um, uh, what do you call it? Like surge pricing. So uh, partly it annoys people. So <coughs> I'm, I'm, I have a good theory of why prices are not much more flexible. I don't want to get into that conversation, but prices are not flexible to a large extent in this, in this market as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at, uh, well, we'll we we're going to have, we have nice data in the sense that we have individual uh, high frequency time series data to look at you know how how people are responding to different uh, interventions uh, we're going to look at experimental evidence we give people 
information about uh, demand, excess demand, etc., and see how they respond. That's sort of a, a very straightforward and closely related to what I said. And we're going to look at uh, if there is any. And test is an ambitious word here. Uh, we're going to say, try to say something about: Do you think that if I give you a, a temporary shock to to the supply supply, does that have durable effects on the demand? So the effect of the demand demand to supply transition, and we have uh, you know some. We'll also in passing we'll also talk about the the, the typical context in which these have been studied is in the context of labor supply. You know, one, you know taxi markets have, and bicycle uh, taxi markets and all these things have places where people study labor supply. We'll have something to say about that. We can also do this exercise, but that's not our, pri our primary interest is in quant responses to quantities, not to prices. <coughs> so. This is an unfair and quick summary of the literature, um, three different literatures. Uh, this is maybe a stretch, the first one, the connection. Uh, this one is, I think, um, obviously background. Um, and, uh, and then there is some, there's a literature on labor supply which we are tangentially related to. There's more actually on each of these, obviously, yeah, much, much, much more. Okay. So this is this. We're working with Grab. Grab is a very large company in in Asia. Uh, for example, it acquired Uber Southeast Asia operations in March 2018. So this is this is a very large. Uh, Company uh, in in Asia, it's one, it's it's the the biggest player, in fact, I think, uh, in many countries, and it's it's uh, it came up with an innovation which is called Grab Hitch, and the there is some ambiguity to their intent in in that description, in the sense that. They advertise it as, you know, it's peer to peer. So you're going to work. Why not take someone with you? Uh, and then you could meet someone nice uh, who you could be friends with. But friends is all the pictures, the photos seem to show attractive women and all that. So I suspect there is some amount of, um, let's say, disingenuousness in the advertising. I'll, I'll, I'll <coughs> skip, uh, but. Nonetheless, uh, this this is uh, it's a large scale attempt to get a lot more casual than so. Even Uber drivers are on you know sometimes it's a whole day job for them. This is the idea here is that it won't be a whole whole day job. You're going to work. Why not take someone with you? It's more fun. It's less boring when you're sitting in traffic, etc. Just just because just because you'll see how it's set up. It's set up slightly differently to allow people to who have let's say a more um, they don't want to be picking up all day. They just want to be picking up at eight a.m. and at six p.m. or something. So and normally there's some restriction of like minimum hours. Mm, may not be. I actually don't know. But uh, the fact is that this, this is a different, uh, Rima uh, will uh, answer it. There's two it. things. One, um, you make a plan like the day before, and then other people make plans, and then you see if the plans match, as opposed to somebody. Yes, so, so that, that, that I was going to say. Like, I mean. go out there and, then, and then there are restrictions on the number of rides you can do per day. Um, and so, and it's, just, it's also like you're not making a huge amount of money. Yeah, you couldn't live off it. You, 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 the prices are lower uh, than. And and uh, it's basically cover your travel cost. It's not for making money. It's for. It's also easier to sign up as a driver on the Hitch platform rather than as a professional driver. That you can be approved 
almost the next day or two days after you put it in the application. <coughs> but if you're signing up the previous day, you can see how many others have signed up on both sides of the market? Yeah, so that's what Apogee is going to talk about in, uh, next, the, the, all the data we have. It's not a real time. It, you don't sign up real time. You just sign up ahead of time. Correct. So you can actually see the supply situation and the demand situation. Yeah, I think there are two margins. I think you can see the contemporaneous supply situation. Uh, and, but I think I'll, some of these people, I think the decision is really whether I will pay attention to this, make plans, etc. So there's an extensive margin. I think the extensive margin is m much less predictable. The intensive margin of sh when, should I make a plan for 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. tomorrow is easier to predict than the extensive margin, which is uh, would I, do I want to do this every day or something? Because you know, then I have to pay attention to this, be involved in this whole monitoring what's going on, and that that things that's a more elaborate investment. Uh, Rima said that there was a cap on the amount you can drive for this service. So why is that? Is that important to how we understand it? Was there a reason? I just there's there's a cap, but is there a reason for the cap other than like they just don't want professional drivers on? The I think they don't want to crowd out their own. Uh, own platform. Uh, they have two very uh, you know parallel platforms, and I think they are worried about crowd out. Um, so, the way it works, this is uh, is that you you actually make a plan. So rather than being open to tr trips which you are assigned to, and then some you know canceling at some implicit or explicit cost. Here you are completely, you know, you make your plan. You propose that I will take someone from x to x to y at such and such time. Uh, and you propose that and you put it on the, on the app. And then you see if, uh, you know, I will go from point A to point B. Uh, drivers do the same thing. They put up their uh, their intentions, and then Grab will ma match the two, and then there will be some several rounds of of confirmation, including often cancellation from one side or the other at the last moment. There doesn't seem to be a cost to canceling, so so which may be a mistake, uh, but it's uh, so there is actually less predictability even here. Because so I think if, if your driver cancels, then is, does the system try to uh, hook you up with somebody else, or you're just stranded? You're stranded. Um, so what do we know, uh, Ben? How how long do I go? Uh, so I think this session goes until ten fifteen. Okay, I, I have plenty of time. I don't have that much to say. Um, driver plans. We know the driver plans, destination, departure time that they were proposing. Passenger candidates shown to the driver. Uh, by the way, I should say very importantly, uh, we, we are very much in the middle of this uh, project. And it would be an excellent time to get suggestions on what else we can do with the lots of beautiful data we have, which we haven't necessarily milked to the hilt at all. So any, 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 any ideas you have will be much appreciated. Uh, passenger bookings on the, you know, where do I want to go to, et cetera, at what time. Um, then we know what happened as a result of that. And we know uh, user histories uh, on Grab. Yeah. Do drivers get to express preferences over the passengers they might carry? or Because uh, I, I get to see which passengers are potential candidates, but do I get to express that to the platform? Which, which I prefer? Yes. And have just a rank order list? I don't know. The, the very final step for a, a driver to confirm a passenger is that they choose a passenger from the list. So there is actually direct 
driver input in which they express their preferences by choosing among the available packages. And so, so gra gra Grab proposes you a list yeah. and you pick. And, and they're doing something in sequence with the drivers to, to clear the market? How big is Grab's total market share? So like, if you see, you know, to what extent are seeing these other two Grab platforms, the outside? Huge part, huge part of the market share. Incre less, less at this time than now, because now they also, they, they, they bought Uber. So, but still, huge part of the market share. So big, the big player. We're integrated, yeah. So now they're, they're, for the passengers, it's being integrated. So you see the price of a Grab pitch and a Grab, regular Grab. But at the time we were doing the experiments, that hadn't quite happened yet. I mean, from the cancellation panel, so like if they're stranded, that's actually maybe good for Grab. And I guess you can see that in your data, whether they switch over to use another Grab service. More so I'll show you something like that in a minute. Uh, not quite that, but some, something related to that. So here's some, what does the data look like? From in our data, we have um, you know, four million uh, plus rides, most of them from Singapore. That's not an accident. Singapore is a much more mature market. They were starting out in Malaysia and they were uh, well established in Singapore. So these are, these are not, uh, this is what you'd expect. And you can see that um, you know in Malaysia there are many fewer drivers with positive number of rides. These are people who have proposed plan. A driver is someone who's proposed a plan, but is, or at least has been admitted. Is it a proposed plan or somebody is admitted to be a driver? Proposed a plan as well. So drivers have pro proposed a plan, uh, and you know uh, drivers on average have proposed the, you know, many plans um, and they've given not, I mean, you know, I think relative to, so the way to think about this is that this is much less, you know, of a professional, uh, you know, many Uber drivers have given 5,000 rides. These are 64 rides in the mature market. So that's a much less, it's much, I think much more of a one-off thing. Partly, this also reflects that even in in uh, in Singapore, Hitch itself is a new product. It's a very much a new product. Um, so the market is actually uh, so. The, what is measured here is the week in which <coughs> the plan was created. So. This is entry of drivers, and the entry of drivers kind of is flattening in both markets, uh, though at different levels. But there was a fast growth period in Singapore, and now it's not growing anymore very much. So it's, it's relatively, uh, it, the reason why I think partly they were interested in working with us was that they were a bit worried about the fact that this this hasn't been a, a tremendous success. I think that's that's the way to, uh, so they were, you know, things were slowing down, but without, where people are given 64 rides, but the market is already slowing, that's, it's not, it doesn't look so great. Um, this is not surprising, that it's a uh, bimodal distribution of, of uh, travel times, uh, as you would expect. Uh, there is, uh, you know, morning and evening is when the, big travel times are. Um, so here's what, uh, going back to one of M Michael's questions, not quite answering his question, but something we started by looking at is, you know, one possibility is that you, you try to give, give a ride, you fail, you drop out, you don't make any more plans, okay? That's the way, that's what's going to generate, for example, lots of you know, close to multiple equilibria, lots of volatility, uh, et cetera. So if it is the case that a random event you didn't manage to match on your first plan uh, or first week or something happens and you don't manage to uh, uh, ma get any rides, you just drop out. That doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it seems both places, uh, you know, conditional or no ride, you are active afterwards. 
on on the app. So that's a, that's a that's a that's moves away from a lot of instability. It's a message that will keep coming back, which is that the market is nonetheless pretty stable. And I think that's that's you can already start to see why it might be very stable, which is that people after 16 weeks of getting no rides, they are, you know, um, uh, it's not uh, they're not absolutely gone. So they're uh, the people are keep trying. Yeah. Start. So I mean, do they have any? Should we be surprised by this? Do they have any reason to like erase the app or like this? No, but this or? work. It's work. Still putting in a plan, etc. I see. So you still so so active here means they're still doing a thing every day. They're like not every day, but occasionally. Occasionally. Some frequency. Occasion. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it seemed like there were more rides in the evening than in the morning. Yeah. No. 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 More concentration. Not more rides necessarily. It's just the integral. The integral is necessarily the morning. Uh, the band is wider than the afternoon band. So what you showed us on the last slide was the PDF. Uh, yes. No. Oh, the PDF. PDF. A PDF. The, the peak oh. time is wider in the morning. Yeah. Um, I can put up a plan that lasts for a long time. So I don't have to do it every day. I can say, every day I'm interested in a ride at 8 AM from point A to point B for the foreseeable future. So in principle, I could put up, uh, uh, put up something that's uh, good for, I could say how long is good for. Possibly, yes. Just to come back to soft switch, how much of this table here can be explained by people who put a plan in place, forget about it, yeah. and then never follow it again? Do we know if after 16 weeks somebody actually wants to take the ride, whether they actually offer the ride, or do they say, oh, I forgot about that 15 weeks ago, I've cancelled it? You see what I mean? Yeah, Zoe. This table is actually, um, we're measuring activity by actually having to. Um, make some interaction with the app. With the so app. In this, in this table where only our definition of active requires that um, a driver was making a new plan, not just, um, not just having an active plan that they made many weeks ago. So for this table in particular, we're looking at actual interaction with the, okay. with the app. Thanks. Uh, thank you. OK. So uh, this, is, this is an experiment where there were lots of drivers who had not made a plan or completed a ride in, in 60, 60 days. Uh, we, that was our focus, but we also were straight up of people who have made a plan but didn't. So these are the people who are not getting rides. Uh, maybe they're not proposing the right kinds of plans or they're, uh, you know, they're not flexible enough or, uh, or they're just canceling on one side or the other. So we were into, with, with this pool, and this is sort of reflects very much, uh, very much, uh, you know, grabs interest in this, in working with us. Um, so w what we do is we give them information about the market. We also give them actually a, a, a price uh, bonus. Uh, uh, these are the different, I'll tell you the interventions in a minute. And we, so what are the interventions? Uh, pure control, we're not going to use them at all. We're just going to not say anything about them right now. Because in some sense, even if you get a message saying, we miss you, offer a ride, with no, nothing else in it, that might have an effect. So re reason we don't want to use the pure control is the pure control is people who might have completely forgotten about this, this uh, app. Uh, and uh, whereas these these are people who are uh, so we want to have at least some message coming to them so that they are alerted to the possibility maybe that has a big effect so in some sense it's it's not a uh, we're going to give you information about you know some will get information about you know about density um, Mm, high or low, and uh, this is in the tradition of economics, which is 
somehow uh, we have come to, uh, to this equilibrium and uh, we are going to uh, assume that we are going to tell people the truth meaning we will tell them we will take the distribution there is variation in the distribution we will pick two different points in the distribution and tell it to them. This is a particular piece of fraud which I do not particularly like but uh, you know we might as well openly lie but uh, somehow we have decided that this is better than openly lying. I mean you know this is the whole thing is I, I have no problem with telling people things that are not true but somehow this is supposed to be a methodological uh, imperat imperative. Sorry? It's a big deal in economics. I understand. I, I, I have never understood it. Um, I mean, given that we do this, I never understood it. Um, so, so, so the, <coughs> the logic or the empirical evidence for why not to do it is, I think, very much about lab experiments with small captive pools. That if you have 300 uh, members of a lab, you keep lying to them, they start to know that you're lying. I, I, I am. I, there's I, some I, evidence on that. There's even I, I, I would even believe that, but that seems to me to be irrelevant to. I, I irrelevant to what we are doing here. Uh, we are going to, we will turn out that d as you can imagine uh, Scott, I, I won't have a debate on methodology. So, if there is anything about you know whether we should lie or not, we will postpone that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, I am happy to have that discussion maybe in the discussion can block because I suspect people in the room have opinions on it uh, or I have inferred from the discussion that people have opinions on it. I just have a suggestion on this specific point. Could you change the catchment areas under consideration to allow you to vary those percentages? No. That was our original plan, but it turns out people take such big detour. Like that's basically what we're trying to do, and we'd like to. I, I was. I'm happy to talk about it later. Cool. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into it, but then not completely. Yeah. So we. All, so you'll see why um, density might be uh, not. We eventually realize that density may not be a sufficient statistic. So we eventually started giving them. Excess demand information. Could you, could you, yeah. you know, aside from the experimental things you could do, could you, you've got driver's choice. You know which passengers drivers choose. So you could sort of do some hedonics on that. You know, how do they vary? The yeah, we, 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 have, we have discussed that. I think gender is going to be s dominate the hedonics of that one, no, sadly. I, I, I um, yeah. uh, uh, but, but that would be. We will we, we, we'll do a little bit of hedonics in a minute. Uh, you see if you want more than that. We are going to do a little bit of hedonics in a minute. Uh, companionship, uh, we can just send a message. Okay? So, financial incentives, small or large, these are, this is sort of good if you wanted to estimate like a uh, supply elasticity, that is what you would use. This is a kind of a excess, uh, you know, a uh, responding to the quantity information, which is our main focus, these two uh, experiments. Okay. What are we going to do? We are going to uh, put in a, a, a stratum fixed effect, control for the number of pre previous rides in principle, but then it is just a treatment. So, it is there is nothing particularly uh, sophisticated. Uh, we are going, we does not really matter. Uh, we are going to look during the experiment, after the experiment, a, month, a week after the experiment, month after the experiment. Okay? So, just look at because that's exactly what we're interested in. We're interested in the question: Is there durable? Are there durable effects of, of, uh, of getting, giving a shock to the supply? Does that have persistent effects? So that's that's. So we're going to look out after the experiment. Yeah. So I was talking about this uh, market in Washington D.C. Yes. It's not app based, but yeah. but that had the exact opposite rule that the driver is not allowed to choose. And I wondered whether you know you could try to. You could try to work with the company to experiment <coughs> on setting up, you know, on varying that because obviously some drivers would drop out, but that might make it more, make the service more attractive to some passive potential passengers. It's a totally good idea. Um, I don't know whether the, we will run another experiment with them, but so, but you're totally right. Okay, so maybe there is a positive velocity of supply. I'm get, I, I, my interpretation of this is that we can't reject some positive elasticity of supply, but the you know the estimated elasticity is zero. Okay, so this is this is just just to get that elasticity question off the, off the table. The estimated elasticity is, the, is you can't reject zero. Uh, you could all can't reject some positive elasticities, etc. 
Um, Sorry, but you said there's not much variation in pairs? No, no, uh, absolutely. But there's experimental. Remember, oh, the, through the experiment. experimental variation in the fair. So we, we, we have, it's just estimated from that. Um, Abhijit, this is what, what time frame? How long is this uh, uh, bonus for? And three days uh, in Singapore, five days in Malaysia. But remember, these are, people can respond very quickly. There's nothing. There's no fixed cost involved. It's, you, know, you don't even have to, you just keep taking people along while you go to work. So it's, it, the response is, this is the lowest fixed cost end of the, you're not even taking a day off to drive. Always during weekdays and so on. Yeah. So, um, there is, uh, so, the density information has, uh, <coughs> so I'm going to show you both plans. Let me show you one, one comment, plans and rides. Okay, there are two possible outcomes. One is more of a, a supply side, pure supply side response. The other is an equilibrium response because after all, after I propose a plan, somebody is going to could say no. So. Uh, one, but both are a supply. Both are supply shocks, but one is moving along the demand curve, and this is just the supply curve. The problem with interpreting this as a pure supply curve is that you could actually make multiple plans. So number of plans is made a. Uh, you make a freshing. You may may not make a fresh plan, or you make a make a fresh plan and stick to it for uh, the foreseeable future. So in some sense, the number of plans is a, is a kind of a not perfect measure of supply. It's, it's what we have. Or maybe we can do something more sophisticated. We take suggestions. But that's, that's what we have so far is some, some supply response and some equilibrium quantity response. Um, so supply response, the thing to uh, note is that you know, these two numbers are identical. These are actually not distinguishable. but the high density doesn't have necessarily, the, so this is in Malaysia, the high density doesn't necessarily get you more than uh, low density. So, and so it may well be that, so density is basically match rates. So when I tell you a match rate, is, is, is it the case or a potential match rate, actually more like a supply of a demand, so how many passengers are, are there. So when I tell you how many passengers are there, uh, you, it may, you, can, you don't see that there is a big difference between these. In particular, during the subsidy period, uh, maybe that the subsidy blunted the response because more people were responding, but we don't really see that in the data either. Uh, but in any case, we don't see a response. Following that, there is a supply response. Uh, or to demand. So supply does respond to demand. Um, but you might think that part of the reason why we get these different, I mean, these, as I said, these are not statistically different, but uh, different results could be just because there is actually, when I say the density is anything, of course, we don't know people's priors. So we don't know whether they thought there are three people riding. And in fact, I tell them 100,000 or 300,000, it makes no difference uh, to, to them. They're responding. We, we wanted to elicit priors, but that was ruled out by, I mean, there would be a lot of work to do, and they didn't uh, want us to do it. Yeah. Uh, anyone you might be able to segment the market in ways that reveal that, that you might have priors about how they relate to their priors? So, like, look at the subsample of people who've given or taken lots of rides before or something like that? Good idea. We can, we can certainly do that, yeah. Um, if there's no cost for like, <coughs> proposing a plan that doesn't get followed up on, is this what you would have expected? That, you know, yes, there is some cost. You have to do the plan. It takes some minutes of focus time. I, I, I think of it as being a costly activity. Okay. Yeah. So they seem to be responding less to density high, <coughs> at least a week after, than density low. I, I, that's what I was saying. They're not statistically actually, maybe they are distinguishable. Certainly it is the case that uh, we, we don't have an explanation of it. Uh, what, but possibly because they, and I, I'll come back, I'll, I'll, I will say something about a potential explanation. So 
in a minute in a minute but let, let, let's come back to this so the question and when we come to the next slide you'll, I'll come back to that so here you do see some uh, some response the response is not tiny uh, it's a 17 point five point five percent increase um, so Singapore very different story okay all the responses of density are negative I tell you the market is is uh, bigger you respond less okay. so several possible explanations why so when you know it's these are not significant but these are significant the, the you know the more dense it is so one possible explanation is adverse selection when I'm telling you that the market is the density is high I'm actually telling you that there is lots of supply as well I have not tell you, told you anything about supply people have a theory of supply which is that actually there must be lots of if their density is that high then maybe there are lots of drivers as well we didn't tell them excess demand here we told them density uh, that's one possible explanation is that this is this is this is what uh, what they're reading they're reading the fact that the market is a second explanation which I'm we're going to favor is uh, is uh, you'll say, I'll come back to in the next slide let me say one more thing so what we did was we told them about that the excess demand was higher or uh, we told them what the excess demand was and the excess demand knowing the excess demand and knowing the fact that there is lots of excess demand had a negative effect you know maybe they were annoyed that they were being underpaid <laughs> yeah so there's all kinds of uh, different forms of adverse selection that's one 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 particular uh, ad adverse selection there are many <laughs> different forms of that which is that you're trying to infer the the macro state of the market and what you should you know what uh, from from this and all of those explanations I, I put in one bin. The other explanation, which is what we're going to favor, is um, is uh, in a minute. Okay. Right, let me say the right thing and come back to it. So the Mal Malaysia, we see more plans, but really nothing on rides. In Singapore, not true. We do see when I give ex and when the excess demand is um, when the excess demand uh, treatment reduces the number of plans, it actually also reduces the number of rides. Uh, the large bonus uh, increases the number of rides uh, in the short run, but you see a, a long run decline. This might be Lucas and wrapping uh, kind of. Uh, intertemporal substitution of labor supply. Uh, it's the first time in my life I actually uh, believe this uh, theory, but uh, it, it's you know th that this is a big a big effect. But it, there is maybe that's what's going on. I, I I don't I don't have a great story for that. I want to focus on the excess demand here has a negative effect. Certainly, there's no positive eff effect on on the number of rights. So let now, yeah. So it would have been interesting if I guess maybe if there was some interaction treatment of the companionship and the excess demand. Like if people initially think, oh, this is an exclusive club of you know cool people like me who use this thing, and now you're telling me there's two hundred thousand, you know, the unwashed masses are coming to use <laughs> thing, uh, then I really want to stay away from that. Okay, that's a good idea. I, I guess I, don't, I guess we can't we can't like we can't do that because we don't have separate treatments. Uh, would be a good idea. Uh, we hadn't quite. So here's one way to think about, and this is this goes to Michael's point about hedonics. Uh, one question, one other reason to be. Uh, why we may see this perverse responses is you're telling me uh, that actually the market is thicker and therefore I can be pickier. Uh, 
that this not that I don't need to necessarily be uh, deliver on on uh, whatever plan the buyer wants. I, I there are many more buyers, therefore I'm going to be pickier. So when I give this message that you know. Uh, there is lots and lots of buyers or uh, riders, I'm going to start becoming very picky. Okay. So how do we know picky? Well, we, we had to create, we create a quality index, basically you looking at people who give rides and uh, you know, take, take the people who, uh, uh, you know, who actually give rides and estimate from them what preferences are. Uh, but it would be good if we could save like maybe the last five minutes for general discussion. Yeah. So like till ten ten. I'm I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. So we predict a score for uh, for uh, for a candidate plan pair based on drivers past. So in principle, we control for driver's past. We have, this is just the hedonic regression. Essentially, did I agree to give a ride to somebody based on what, they were pro, what their characteristics are? Okay, so this is a, effectively a hedonic regression. And from this, we, uh, we can uh, back out uh, sorry. Uh, we can now ask what's happening and you can see that things start to make more sense here you can see that both density low and density are high what they do is they make you give higher quality quality weighted rights this is what we are uh, the outcome here is quality weighted rights so quality weighted rights actually go up so it's more it behaves more uh, normally i would say so i think that doesn't prove that this is what's going on but it suggests that uh, once we understand the quality dimension, things are much, much less bizarre. So we do, you know, we can't really run the regressions we were running at the beginning, in a sense. Yeah, Simon. Just to play devil's advocate, that's 33 coefficients. If I have the null hypothesis, none of the treatments affect anything. That would be fine too. But we don't find negative. We won't. I don't think we'll find the bizarre negative effects either. Quality weight rights, that just basically means pe people are using this to look for dates, basically. So or whatever. Yeah. They're looking for something. I, I, we, uh, I think we're not putting as much money on, on any specific hypothesis. So let's go. I, I'm going to go quickly to the end, and then, then we can have. So what we do is we now, just to see, is there an we, we kind of saw, saw that demand does have an effect potentially on, on supply, at least in Malaysia, we see a positive effect. In, in Singapore, in fact, there is a negative effect. If there's a, really a negative effect, the feedback loop there is not going to go anywhere. You know, if supply, if supply reduces, dem, if demand reduces supply, then we're going to converge very quickly to the equilibrium, basically. There's no multiple equilibria or persistence or anything like that. Okay, so the persistence. So in Malaysia, maybe there's a positive effect, but you know, in Singapore, certainly, from the buyer's point of view, from the seller's point of view, the fact that the quality matters is important. From the buyer's point of view, it just means fewer drivers, and fewer drivers is bad news. Uh, so we look at the full power of the experiment. There's a whole bunch of messages. Some are maybe increase supply, some don't. We use all of that to l basically do an event study. Uh, what happens when we start the experiment? Uh, does does uh, to does the increase in supply in that during that week? Is there one? Yes, there is an increase in supply. Is does that have a feedback effect on demand? Okay, so that's kind of demand to supply, supply to demand. That's the positive feedback arguments. And the, uh, so uh, there is some effect on made plans uh, in, in both places. Uh, and total number of plans also goes up. So the, from the bias point of view, there is some improvement. Uh, so this might you this is uh, so in Malaysia uh, the driver match rates are flat the pa passenger match, match rates do go up 
in uh, maybe in Singapore. Uh, so, you can see that uh, the passenger mass, this is almost significant, it is a T of 1.5. Uh, in, in Singapore, it is quite sign significant. Uh, the passenger mass rates go up, driver mass rates conversely go down, that is not surprising. In some sense, you are, you know, uh, if there are more drivers, that is bad news for the drivers and good news for the etcetera. So, passenger, passenger uh, mass, mass rates go up and driver mass rates going down uh, is what you, you find. Uh, final slide, uh, there is no effect on future per passenger behavior. So, if you see this, this as having a shocked supply temporarily, this has no effect on, on future passenger behavior. Um, I'm, so, I'm very confused. So I thought your driver supply went down when you gave density information. No, but uh, re remember, we are the supply dr drivers supply went down, making plans went down, but the the, the, the amount of um, number of plans that get executed, the quality move partly is that they are they are picking the ones they like. So the the, the actual executed plans don't have to go down. And this is, and the point is that this is five, all the experiments together. This includes just sending you a message, sending you a price information, uh, giving you a bonus. This is the aggregate experiment. So the, this is the aggregate effect of an, think of the experiment as an event study. I start, I start the experiment, I did five different things. Some of those have positive effects, some of them negative effects. This is the aggregate effect of that. <coughs> because some of these are, some of the, the price bonus increases supply. So, it, this is just the aggregate of that. Do you have, do you have natural variation from like high occupancy vehicle time of day restrictions? Mm, like, you know. You might. I, Singapore has all of those things. M not KL, but I think Singapore has all of those things. So, we may be able to look. So, I I wouldn't put it too strongly. The t, uh, the probability for the wall test is uh, only, you know, 0.153. It's not dispositive, but mostly we find. I'll just stop here. <coughs> find no compelling evidence that uh, there is a strong feedback loop which is going to lead to a durable change. Uh, there is no dur effect, no evidence of a durable effect of a short term intervention and there is no effect. So, there is either maybe there is learning, but the learning is not strong enough. Maybe there is a positive feedback loop, but it is not strong enough, but e we do not find any anything like that. We, we do manage to shift some of these things, but there does not seem to be any reason why, uh, you know. Uh, a short term inter intervention in this market, which in principle could make the market very different, actually has, we have no reason to believe that it has big, big long term effects. I will stop there. Yeah. Uh, Do the Grab guys have any opinions about the big difference in results in Singapore and Malaysia? Yeah. Mm, they talk about ma mature markets and non-mature markets. So in ma Malaysia, there is more aggregate uncertainty, and uh, therefore the inferences might be different. Were they surprised by them? Uh, in Singapore, they know maybe they know already that you know you can get a ride, uh, you can get a driver, a rider, but maybe uh, therefore their reaction is more okay. This means I can get an even more attractive woman or whatever. That's that's the direction they go. In Malaysia, they are partly learning about what's available. So maybe there is less clear inference from that. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for, for a lot of the talk, the distinction between being a matching market and a spot market felt like it was kind of intention. Uh, there, there's a paper by Ariali, Hortasher, and Hitch about online dating. I know. So, I just yeah, paper work. And it, so that's where, it, like, I'm a little bit more interested in the rules and things like that. Like, d is the passenger side kind of screening against your new drivers? Are they, you know, like, how do they? So we, we yeah. haven't looked at it. That's a perfectly good question. We haven't looked at it at all. Um, 
that would be really interesting if they're basically, you know, like if you can imagine the rules be something like if I have matched to someone, the app assumes I'm going to continue to be matched to them, so the only way to get new draws is to reject people or like the, so like the rules about that stuff and how I can access new it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a it's a different set of questions about the hedonics of the of the matching market um, it's not what, what we set out to study but yeah it's a you're right, asking absolutely the right question which is could you use the data for that or could someone use it yeah Matthew. so you, you mentioned that like the lack of price flexibility makes some adjustment harder but I, I was thinking that like the distance, the detour is kind of functioning like a price because you're driving more miles for the same price. Whereas like the experience is pretty homogenous for the rider because they get picked, it sounds like they get picked up at their home and dropped off at their destination. So um, I was just wondering if you could exploit that more um, to understand like how people respond. It's sort of, drivers are sort of responding to prices when they respond to like the detour, but maybe that's not the most salient feature of the match. No, I, I think you. I think you're right that that there is that's that sort of detour is in the qual that quality measure you saw. So people are responding to it, and you see detour going down. In fact, people are taking. Le we didn't show it, but there's a table showing that detour goes down. People actually choose one of the ways in which they manipulate it when they get the quantity from it. Uh, they do that. On the other hand, I would say that this, that all, all of that makes it clear why uh, the sort of the idea that if I give you quantity information, you're going to, I can predict what you're going to do, is gets more and more complicated. There's so many dimensions of adjustment that uh, people, the idea that people will learn and therefore change behavior, uh, gets, you know, hard, harder to predict what they're going to do with that information. I mean, in that sense, it's not like a price. In the sense that the price is is uh, is something that's exogenously given to them, uh, whereas the, here they are. Uh, you have multiple margins, and they could choose, you know, more attractive women or whatever. You know, more um, I, I don't know, whatever whatever they. I mean, maybe I'm talking about the. The, the way the Washington DC market works is it's got a fixed, I think, it's got a fixed pickup, it's definitely fixed pickup locations, which are subway stops, and um, and fixed, I think fixed drop-off places as well, although I'm not so sure about that. But that, that obviously can create a thicker market because the, then I don't know whether the company is interested in it, and to the extent that market thickness is important, they can think about doing that. I mean, standardizing, routes, tender, standardizing routes, standardizing routes will be, yeah, it's a good idea. Uh, yeah, in Indonesia right now, they're talking about doing that particularly as like a last mile thing to get to the the trans like the, the public transportation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, Indonesia used to have that, yeah, like Washington D.C. If you uh, because they had a HOV lane, uh, Jakarta had exactly that, which is you could pick up some some professionals who would just ride around. Uh, and get paid for it. Um, it was a <laughs> cool. Uh, why don't we adjourn for now? Take further questions offline, and at ten thirty we come back for uh, the elephant sutra.